Timirandasmi, Tajana Salakaya, Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Vinamaha, Nama Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale, Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamane, Namaste Saraswati Deve, Gauravani Pacharine, Mir Vishesha Shunyavadi, Pastyat Yadri Satarine, Panchakalpa Taru Bischa, Kripa Sindhu Bay Bacha, Ditanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Mahamaha, Jai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasari Gaur Bhakta Rinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we are uh, approaching the uh, appearance day of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Shri Krishna, Janamastami. <laughs> which is tomorrow, 30th of August, 2021. Jana means birth, and Astami means eighth day after the full moon. So Jana Mastami indicates the time of the month when the Lord will appear. Janma means birth, and we understand that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is called Aja, or self-born, or we also can use the word unborn. He is unborn because he does not take birth. He appears. We take birth. We have a father, we have a mother, Krishna has a father and mother, but he still doesn't take birth. So his birth is divyam. Divyam means transcendental. It means something outside of the worldly atmosphere of existence. And uh, we celebrate him as taking birth, but yet he doesn't take birth. We see the sun rises in the morning over the eastern horizon, and that is called dawn or daybreak. And then the sun traverses its orbit, natural orbit, up the eastern side. He goes up and he goes to his left, or he goes towards the southern direction. Now he's going up and over, and then he reaches the highest point that he goes, and that is called midday or noon. That is also the second, uh, what we say, uh, uh, junction of the day. The first junction is the birth, the appearance of the sun, and then the sun goes to its second junction, highest point in the sky. And then moving towards the western direction, he gradually descends and then disappears. And that is called dusk over the horizon. And then soon all of the light of the sun is gone. And that, that takes place every day. So the sun appears, stays for some time, performs some of his activities and then disappears. And then he comes again, the same son. Is he reborn when he, after he disappears? No, he just goes to another area of the world where those who perceive him in one area cannot perceive him in another area. So there used to be an ancient folk tale or even a belief that the sun dies at sunset and then is recreated again at sunrise. But we know that this is some foolishness. The sun is always where it is in its orbit. 
In fact, you, it says if you drive your plane in the rest, the western direction, and you keep heading in the west by plane, you will never see darkness. You will always be in the light of the sun. You can follow the sun. You can follow the light of the sun by just by going in the western direction, because the sun always travels in that direction. Hmm. Um, so those who are not very intelligent, in the same way, the Supreme Personality of Godhead appears in this world, and that's called Janma, or birth. And he performs his activities. He has a father, he has a mother, he even has friends and family members. But still, he remains Aja, or unborn. He appears and disappears. The analogy of the sun helps us to give a little indication. And so, but we still, we honor him as being born, or janma must be, janma means birth. And therefore, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, janma karma, chime divya me bhaveti totpataha, taktva purna janma naitimam eti surjuna. One who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not, upon leaving this body, again take birth in this material world, but attains to my abode. And he ends by saying, O oh, son of Prita, he's speaking to Arjuna. So one who understands that the Lord does not take birth, his birth is divyam, transcendental, not part of this material world. And the activities he performs are not within the confines of the three modes of material nature, which are the confines of all of our activities. We either act in the mode of goodness, passion, or ignorance, or a combination or a mixture of these modes. We have so many activities. But the Lord, Although he performs the activities within the material world, he remains transcendental. Another example you could give, it's a crude example, is that if you're going out in a rainstorm, if you have an umbrella, rain coat, rain hat, rain shoes, uh, nicely covered by rain protective garments, you don't get wet, but you're in the midst of the rainstorm. In the same way, we can use that analogy to see that the Lord appears in the material world, but is not part of the material world, nor is he affected by the material world. His nature is dipyam, it's transcendental. And he performs his activities, and they appear to be like the activities of people in the material world, but they are not. That's why he says, one who knows the transcendental nature of my birth and activities does not take birth again in this material world. In other words, one is liberated and goes back to the spiritual world. So that is our uh, uh, focus to try to hear about Krishna, try to understand the nature of Krishna's activities through the process of hearing along with cultivating the mood of devotional service simultaneously. These two things, hearing about Krishna and performing service to Krishna, these two things will help give the realization that Krishna is divya, or transcendental, not part of this material world. So, that mentions in the Bhagavad Gita, why does he come? Some people say, well, well, the Lord doesn't come, or why should he come? But the Lord is independent. He is called Swarat. He is described in the first verse, in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Satyam Param Dimahi. He is Swarat. Swarat means he is independent. But in this case, the word Swarat means totally independent. No one can surpass him. No one can control him. He is the supreme controller of all and independent of everything. 
So he can appear in this world, and he does. Mm -hmm. He says, I do, I come to the material world. What? He says, yada yada hi dharmasya, glanir bhavati bharata abhutanam dharmasya tatatmaham srijamiyaham paritranaya sadunam vinasanaya chaduskritam dharma samstarpanarpaya sambhavami yuge yuge. Yuge yuge means millennium after millennium he, he descends. But in his transcendental form of Krishna, he rarely comes. So that is a special uh, incarnation or appearance. Incarnation means he takes another form, which is non different than himself. He has many forms Advaita, Achutam, Anari, Ananta Rupa, Adyam Purana, Purusho Nava Yoga He has unlimited forms. But his form as Krishna is Adi Purusham, Govindam Adi Purusham Tamaham Bajami, Ishwar Parma Krishna, Satchit Ananda, Vigraha, Anadi Radhi, Govinda, Sarvakarna, Karna. So when he takes his birth in this material world, he comes in different forms of himself, but it's very rare that he comes as himself, the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna. And usually it comes after billions and billions of years, he appears again. So 5,100, and I don't know, between 5,100 and 5,200 years ago, somewhere in between those two numbers, he appeared on this earth to perform his activities. And this verse, yada yada hi dharmasya, why does he come? He comes for three reasons. One, to reestablish religious principles when religious principles are what we say uh, destroyed, dispensed with, seen as uh, just a botheration or thrown out. He comes to keep the Dharma, to reestablish religious principles by his appearance. And he does that in every appearance, but especially as Krishna. And he comes to remove those elements which cause irreligion in the world, big, powerful demons. Uh, these demons are coming from other planets, many of them taking birth in the material world to uh, uh, harass the living entities. That's the business of demons. The demons, our business is to give trouble to others. That's their only business. And to try to usurp the property of the Lord for their own selfish sense gratification and destroy anyone who gets in their way. These are demons. There is a verse in the Bhagavad Padma Purana, I'm sorry, which explains that, yeah, the demons and the Asuras, the Suras and the Asuras, the demigods and the demons are eternally at loggerheads battling one another eternally. It's going on somewhere in the universe and sometimes in many places in the universe. And so we have the earth is now burdened by demons. And you might ask the question, well, Krishna came in order to relieve the earth of that, that burden. What was the, the history? How did that indication of the history in which it says that when the Lord appeared as Parasaram, Shaktivesha avatar, I actually is a Leela avatar and a Shaktivesha avatar, he's considered in both categories. Shaktivesha means empowered for a certain mission. And uh, Leela means the Supreme Lord who performs a certain pastime for the benefit of the, for the earthly beings. Mm -hmm. So as uh, uh, Parasaram, 
he had a strong dislike of anybody who was a ruler who was proud. He didn't like Kshatriyas. And there were many Kshatriyas who were proud. It says in the, era, in the age of Dwarpa Yuga, pride was a very strong element. People had a lot of reasons to be proud. Great strength, great abilities, great armies, great intelligence, uh, great amounts of wealth. All these things were quite profuse in the age of uh, in Dupara Yuga, the age before Kali Yuga. And so there were many powerful kings who were very proud. This was at the beginning, at the end of this Treta Yuga and the beginning of the Dwarpa Yuga. So Parasaram, he came to relieve the burden of these um, uh, avaricious kings in the name of ruling, they were greedy or proud, more like proud than greedy. And so he uh, made it a program, a quite extensive program to destroy these kings by killing them. And with his chopper, he has a chopper and an ax, two things. He is the Supreme Lord, all powerful. So he uh, dispensed with 21 generations of these kings. Practically all over the Earth's planet, he destroyed all these earthly kings. Only a few weren't destroyed because he saw they were all proud. <laughs> now, that became a problem because now the ruling class was no longer there. So what should be done? Someone had to take the rule. And so uh, there was, and the rule had to be in line with religious principles. So there was a concern within the royalty and a concern within the Brahminical culture. The Brahmins were thinking what to do. Shastri was thinking who should be the next king in their different areas of the world. So they decided that we want a class of leaders who are righteous, pious, religious, with a Kshatriya nature, protective nature. And so they made a plan. The Brahmins and the royalty that were there, they got together. And it was a large plan, not just in one area, but they all decided that we need to create or produce another class of beings who would be saintly kings, who would re, re rule by Dharma, kings like Maharaj Pariksit, kings like Maharaj Yudhisthira or Maharaj Prita, great kings. So what they did is the uh, Kshatriya women, the princesses were uh, disputed or deputed, I'm sorry, not disputed, deputed uh, to have relationships with great sages. And this was done. And from that progeny, great, great personalities appeared. And soon, after many decades, again, the world was governed by saintly rule and the earth planet flourished nicely. And this went on for many centuries, but then something happened. And that was, there was a war that broke out in the higher planets. Sometimes people think, well, the higher planets are so nice. There's longevity of life. People have more qualifications materially, great opulences, so many benefits materially. But also in the heavenly planets, a lot of times there's fights between the demigods and the demons. Srimad Bhagavatam 
delineates so many battles between these two forces that take place in different areas of the universe. So in this uh, universal battle, which goes on, there'll always be demons. There are, they are a class of, they are a race of people. There are so many different types of demons. There are rakshashas, there are jinns, there are, uh, what was it, yakshas, there are kusmandas, there are pishashas. Uh, the list is long of the different types of lower creatures who are very intelligent yet very demoniac at the same time. And they exist on different planets throughout the area, the universe. Some of them live on invisible planets. There's one book describing around the earth, there are many of these planets that you can't see. The astrologers and astronomers, they can't see it with their microscopes because they remain invisible. But these are planets inhabited by such beings. And so these beings, or the demons decided to attack the heavenly realm. And so they did, and it was a big fight. Now, the fight went on for a long time, but then the demons were thinking, in order to fortify our position, we need a planet that we can work with from in order to attack the demigods. So they decided on Earth. Mm -hmm. So what happened as described in the Mahabharata is that in various species of life, the demons arranged to take birth. And soon there was a large population of demons all over the earth. And again, the earth fell into depravity. And now we come to the point where mother earth is burdened by these demons. She, the earth is a personality. She's called Bhumi Devi. She is a sentient being. And she, she is the uh, property of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. She's meant to provide the necessities of life for the living entities who are her children. That's why we call her Mother Earth. She is our mother and she provides what we need. But she also restricts when there are sinful activities and she also punishes when there are great activities. Mother Earth is very powerful. She's personified by Mother Durga in her different forms, sometimes even as fierce as Mahakali, who has 16 arms, who is the most fierce of all the manifestations of the Earth in order to destroy the demons. She's Shakti and very, very, she works under the direction of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So the earth became so overburdened that she needed some help. So the earth personified appeared to Lord Indra and prayed to give relief from the suffering Indra was already in battle with the demons. So now the earth is coming because the demigods are also responsible for the affairs on the earth. They are universal controllers. They have a responsibility to provide the necessities and also to punish when needed. And now, uh, Indra, he goes to Lord Brahma and explains the situation. Brahma says, this is a work for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So it's described how Brahma, along with some of the chief demigods, came to the ocean of milk in the material world, which is called Sweta Dweep. There's a planet, the planet is called Dhruvaloka. And on that planet, there is an island, and on that island is called Sweta Dweep. And there the Lord resides in his personal form as Vishnu. 
and he protects the universe and the, he protects the universe or he protects the earth i'm sorry he protects the earth and so the brahma came and explained the situation and uh, the lord knew everything but he was waiting for the petition and then that was the beginning of the unraveling of the Lord's appearance because the Lord appears wherever there is excessive demons on the earth and the earthly planet becomes sinful. We might say we even have that situation today uh, and Prabhupada says we do have it. Even when Prabhupada was here, he would talk about that. He said, but do not worry, Krishna has come. He's come in the form of his holy name. Kali Kale, Namarupa, Krishna Avatar, Namahoite, Hayasarva, Jagat Nistara. So he comes, he's already here in his manifested form as Sri Krishna in the form of his transcendental name, which is non different. Abhinna Tvam Nami Nami Nam is non different from him in his personal form. His personal form and his form as the holy name are one and the same. There is no difference. And so there is the shelter in this particular age. But going back to our story, when the Lord was notified by Lord Vishnu that this is a job for the Supreme Personality of God and Sri Krishna himself, the Lord manifest his form as Krishna, and then he took birth in this world, or he appeared in this world in order to uh, rid the world of demons and at the same time give his association to his devotees, who, and he made his base, his home, Sri Vrindavan Dham, which is a prototype of the actual Vrindavan in the spiritual world, there is no difference. The only difference is the activities on this level are prakat manifested, and on the spirit on the on in the material uh, I'm sorry in the spiritual world they are called aprakat unmanifested, manifested and unmanifested. I'm sorry, it's the other way around. Uh, aprakat is the material world is that sometimes they're manifested and sometimes they're not. In the spiritual world, the pastimes are going on continually. So they are prakat. <laughs> so in order to appease the earth, to rid the world of demons, reestablish dharma, and to give pleasure as devotees, the Krishna comes in. So that is the actual understanding and meaning of the appearance of the Lord known as John Mastami. And the Lord does everything for his own transcendental pleasure. So when he came, he manifested himself. He is called Lila Purushottam. He is there. He is the best of all personalities who exchanges pastimes with his loving devotees. And with the demons, he kills them. He killed Kamsa. He arranged for Jarasandha to be killed. Jarasandha was practically or even more powerful than Kamsa. There was Bakasura, Agasura, uh, Keshi, Aristasara, uh, Vyomasura, so many Asuras, Putana, Sakatasura, Trinavarta. A long list of demons that Krishna dispatched. Now Krishna is Samoham Sarabhute Shunamay Dvaishya He is not partial. He's not envious of the demons. But he kills them in order to give them the benefit of liberation and at the same time relieve them of their demoniac mentality. Every living entity is his dear beloved son or daughter. And so he treats them in different ways according to how best they can benefit. And for, so for the devotees, the Lord is there to give his association 
and exchange loving relationships with them in different forms, as a friend, as a lover, as a parent, or as a just in, just in uh, ordinary servitorship, different ways. But for the demons, he kills them. <laughs> and that is the best thing he can do for them, stops their demoniac activity, and at the same time elevates them to the transcendental realm. So this is a little bit about the upcoming John Mastami, which will be celebrating tomorrow. So this is a little preview of what was there prior to the appearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And uh, it's a great opportunity when we hear about Krishna's pastimes, we should hear in such a way as to try to understand what is the nature of God, how, what he does, why he, why he does what he does, how he does what he does, how he interacts with his devotees. All of these things are necessary to help us develop our loving relationship with Krishna. If you want to develop a relationship with a person, you get to know them. And so just to say God is great, that's nice. God is all powerful, yes. God is all good, yes, we all know that. God is the father, yes, so many things. But how much do we actually know about Krishna? Of course, we can never know fully Krishna, that is not possible. He says that in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, as a Supreme Personality of Godhead, I know everything in the past. I know everything that's happening in the present and I know all, all things yet to come. Yet, I also know all living entities, but me, Krishna says, no one knows. <laughs> so what he says is that no one knows him in full we can get to know him to the point where we can develop our love for him and that is the that is the perfection of life so this john Mastami is a a mercy manifestation of the lord in order for us to move forward on the path of devotion by hearing about him serving him and uh, um, engaging in the process of uh, celebrating his appearance in this world, Janamastami. Okay, so we'll stop there. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna, dear devotees. If you have any questions, comment, or realization, please unmute yourself or you can type in chat window. Hare Krishna. Guru Maharaj, I have two questions if I can ask while sure. devotee ask for more. Uh, so first one is Guru Maharaj, I got this uh, very nice meditation today in our uh, temple WhatsApp group that uh, from Sachinan Maharaj, I think it's from him, that uh, Janmashtami festival, the purpose is that Krishna is not just one 5,000 years back or just he's taking birth once in a year. It's the purpose is that we meditate. So Krishna appears in our heart. And for that, we need to have bhakti. We need to purify ourselves, our heart. So when we do Guru Maharaj fasting on these auspicious days, is the purpose like Ekadashi that we engage ourselves more and more in devotional service and bhakti? Yeah. Mm. Fasting allows you more time and it also gives you... Uh, you know, more energy. When you, when you fast, at least in the beginning, you get a lot of energy. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's the idea. The idea is to, we can qualify our 
uh, our bhakti by quantifying it first. In other words, increasing the amount of time we have spent in bhakti. That way it will bring more opportunities to uh, go deeper in our relationship with Krishna. We shouldn't be just superficial in Krishna consciousness and simply think, oh, yeah, I chant my rounds. And, you know, I, sometimes I read. And but when, it's, when you, someone asks you about Krishna, you can't really say much. You can't really describe his nature, how he deals with people, what's he like, what's the purpose of his birth, what's his purpose of his appearance. Uh, we need all that and helps to fortify our devotion to Krishna. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Right, Krishna. Um, Hare Krishna. I have one more question, but I will uh, request other devotees to ask first, please. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisance since our glory is to Srila Prabhupada and our glory is to you. <clears throat> I would have a question connected to uh, Lord Parashuram. Uh, it might be a little bit a silly question, but, uh, but somehow it bothered me when I, I read this thing and, and I thought of asking that um, in a Shubha Vilas Prabhu's Ramayan book, the first volume, I read that uh, actually uh, Lord Ramachandra's father uh, lived in that period of time uh, while uh, Parashuram was present and uh, killing the... Um, uh, Dikshatiyas, and that uh, this was the reason that uh, uh, that his father, uh, Dasharat Maharaj, had so many wives because this was the way to avoid uh, being killed. And uh, it made me question that uh, Lord Parashuram dis didn't make a difference between Dikshatiyas. I mean, I was surprised to hear that Dasharat Maharaj had to be afraid of being killed by Parashuram. Yeah, that's true. He says that every time the word was out that Parasaram was in the area, he would get another wife. He actually had 350 wives. Although we only hear about the three prominent ones, but if you you go into the Ramayan deeper, you'll find that it's, yes, that the number is 350. So he did that because Parasaram made a vow that he would not kill any Kshatriya who was getting married. So it was a ploy, a trick, to avoid Paris around by getting married every time he was around. And for Shatriya kings, that's natural. They have many wives. Yeah, I just don't understand that uh, he was the type of person whom I would assume that uh, Lord Parashuram doesn't want to kill. So that's why I, I it felt well, strange. Uh, Parasaram is in, Dasarat is not an incarnation of the, of the Supreme Lord, Parasaram is. <laughs> Parasaram even fought with Lord Ramchandra right after the marriage of oh. uh, Ramchandra with Janaki, Sita Devi, they, there was a battle. And Parasaram and Ram very easily defeated him. It was hardly even a fight. We did. So, yeah, but he is, he's powerful, Parasaram. What he did to Kartavarya Arjun, mm. uh, Kartavarya Arjun had killed his, uh, his father, uh, his men killed his father, uh, Jamadagni. So he took revenge. That's, that, well, that's what really sparked the whole thing. The killing of, uh, of Parasaram's father, which was Jamadagni, and then he he developed a hatred towards the Kshatriyas. Kartavirya Arjun was a powerful Kshatriya, and he had many many arms, and he fought 
when he, he tried to fight with Parasuram, Parasuram cut off all his arms and killed him, actually. So, yeah. Actually, uh, it's interesting because I, I think the story is uh, after Kartavari Arjun was killed, then his sons came in when uh, Jamadagni was uh, there with his wife, uh, Renuka, uh, Renuku, Renuka, they killed him as a revenge for Parasuram killing Kartavari Arjun. So it's an interesting, uh, and then Parasuram killed the sons of Kartavari Arjun after that. A lot of killing going on. <laughs> so yeah, so that's that's the history. But um, why Dasarath was afraid of him? Why unnecessarily fight with the supreme personality of God? <laughs> so he used that ploy to avoid, you know, uh, coming into contact. And may I ask what was the reason of uh, Parashuram and Lord Ram's fight? Because I, I haven't heard about that. Yeah, Bar oh, yeah that, that's mentioned. Well, because um, Parashuram got angry at Ram for breaking the bow of Shiva. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah, because was, which was the uh, qualification for winning Janaki was the string the bow, but he not only strung it, he broke it in three pieces and the pieces went through different places in the universe. So he, he challenged him to a fight, but there was mostly a dialogue before the fight. And then the Lord pretty much showed him by dialogue that, you know, Uh, it's interesting. You have to read that section. It's in the Ramayan. <laughs> okay, I, I will. It sounds interesting when when the incarnation. Yeah, Parasurama. Par Parasurama. After he was defeated by Ram Chandra, he he went to Mahendra Mountain and started performing austerities and penances there. He retired from his activities, <laughs> at least for a while. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yeah, read that. Read the Ramayana. I, I, I'm sure Subhas Vilas mentions it in the Ramayana. I think I also yeah. have it. I think I have it also that I can send it to you if you want as a separate ex excerpt. excerpt. Uh, I have all, all his books of Ramayana, which which was published till now. So I just get to, I just have to get to that point because I'm still reading <clears throat> the first volume. There was an argument also between uh, Lakshman and Parasuram. That's also mentioned. It's so interesting that while while these these heroes uh, are. are uh, having a fight. God fighting, with, God fighting with God. Huh? Lots of speaking also going on, so it's interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Hare Krishna. Evil. Hare Krishna Namrata Mataji, you have asked this question, but I hope that question is already answered now. Guru Maharaj just explained that. Who is that? Guru Maharaj uh, Namrata Mataji asked in the chat. Uh, Namrata, yeah. yeah, how does it happen that two avatars of Vishnu, Ram, and Parashram fight with each other? So yeah, she's saying it's right. Fine.
since uh, there is no other question guru maharaj i if i can ask the second question please yeah thank you so guru maharaj your question is also related to parashuram sorry like <laughs> i think on this but uh, this question always remains in my mind that why parashuram uh, killed his mother renuka even yes it his it was his command of his mother jamdagni sorry father jamdagni and uh, it's all past time of a uh, great personality difficult to understand but killing of mother like uh, is like a big thing well, well if you read did, did you read the past time <laughs> yes guru maharaj little bit yes explain like, when that his fa- he didn't want to disobey his father his father was very powerful and so but he knew his father would give him a benediction yes afterwards and so he just brought his mother back to life with that benediction but he knew to disobey his father would have been the worse so he followed that and then by the benediction he asked his father to bring his mother back to life and he did he didn't want to disobey his father so this is a like of course this is not a normal or ordinary personalities and these are uh, this is not a normal past time so the killing no, of no, mother no. is just like yeah this is not like a normal material things so it's just because of a different situation Yeah, we shouldn't try to imitate that. <laughs> no, no, definitely not Guru Maharaj. <laughs> like somebody asked this actually question in one of the satsang that why even like he, yes, it was not like it, it could have become very worse even if he could not have followed. And yes, he got like he resurrected his mother back. But why in first place to get just kill or sorry, kill his mother. Yeah, so. It's explained. Yeah. Because he didn't want to disobey his father. His power father was very powerful. He knew. And he knew his father would give him a benediction. And so he knew that ahead of time. And he know, he knew that all he would, he would bring his mother back to life, which he did. and his brothers too because his his father asked his brothers to do it and they refused to do it so he said you kill your brothers too because they disobeyed my order no <laughs> it's it explains thank you guru maharaj thank you Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Anything else? So dear devotees, do you have any questions or comment? Please unmute yourself. Uh, okay, I'll have no more questions. Okay, we'll stop here and tomorrow is Janamastami and um I think everyone is going to be celebrating so um wherever you are go to your celebrations and uh uh local temples most of them will be having some form of celebration like that and i don't think there will be a class tomorrow because we'll be involved with jan mastami celebrations throughout the day here so um i think we can uh, stop one day for jan mastami and devotees can celebrate in their local areas like that
Okay. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. I think Tuesday is also a very important day, 125th appearance of Srila Prabhupada. Yeah, we'll have class on that day for sure. But uh, for tomorrow, uh, everyone uh, attend your local functions like that. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Anand yeah. Koti Vishnu Brind ki jai. Yeah. Shri Janmastami Mahatma Ki Jai. Yeah.